All right, let's switch gears now and uh, have a look at a randomized control trial. The study that we'll be looking at uh, to go through the critical appraisal of a randomized control trial uh, is a study uh, entitled Dexamethasone in Hospitalized Patients with COVID-19. This was done by the recovery group uh, out of the UK. Um, you may want to pause for a moment and uh, pull up the paper either or print it out or have it available on your devices. Uh, the other thing that um, you could do if you um, are able to uh, is pull up the RCT, the Randomized Control Trial CASP checklist, and you can get that uh, by going to the CASP website uh, and uh, searching RCT. When we're using the CASP checklist for the Randomized Control Trial, there's actually four sections. You'll remember previously when we were talking about the qualitative uh, qualitative research, there were three sections. There's um, just, a, just an extra section um, where uh, in the RCT one uh, where we divide up um, uh, the validity and the methodology a little bit more, um, um, a little bit more discreetly uh, just because of the nature of RCTs. Um, so here you've got screening, set, uh, screening questions in uh, both section A and B. So there's some screening questions um, when we're thinking about the basic study design being valid for an RCT. Uh, and uh, if, you, if the study doesn't meet those screening questions, uh, we end the appraisal right there because it's not a valid study design. Uh, we also have the opportunity to move on if um, the criteria for section A are met. Uh, then we look at whether the study was methodologically sound. So again, um, if the screening, the study doesn't pass the screening questions, we end the appraisal because the study was not methodologically sound. But if it was, then we move on and look at the results, and uh, which is section C, and then we look at whether um, the results have any kind of local or otherwise impact in section D. The first section, section A, is three questions and really we're looking at whether the basic study design is valid for a randomized control trial. So the first part of this question, number one, uh, is around the research question and whether the PICO, whether the research question um, uh, was clearly focused through um, a PICO framework. Research questions don't have to be in the PICO framework, uh, but it's certainly helpful for us when we're cr critically analyzing them uh, to think about it. So PICO stands for population served, intervention given, comparator chosen, and outcomes measured. So the answer to question number one for our study on dexamethasone in hospitalized patients is yes. Um, there was a very clear PICO um, statement. The P, the population, is COVID hospitalized patients in the UK. The intervention given is usual care plus dexamethasone, either oral or intravenous. C is the comparator chosen, and that's usual care. And then the outcomes measured is the mortality at 28 days. For the second question uh, around uh, um, validity uh, of the basic study design is around randomization. Was the, rand uh, was the assignment of participants to interventions randomized? And here we want to consider and think about how the randomization was actually conducted. Was the method appropriate? Uh, was it sufficient to eliminate bias? And was the allocation sequence concealed from investigators and participants? The answer to this question for our study that we're looking at today is yes. Uh, the study authors uh, state that they had web-based randomization with concealment. Uh, so that fits all of the criteria. There were some small, like, so that, 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 that means there was no systemic bias definitely in the randomization. There are a few limitations that uh, we just wanted to highlight. Uh, one is that this was an open label trial. Um, so, um, so the um, care providers and the patients knew what, um, what uh, they were allocated, whether it was an intervention or control. Uh, the other thing is that some sites didn't have uh, dexamethasone available uh, and were excluded. So um, there may be some potential bias um, around selection uh, as well. 
In the final question of section A, where we're looking at the validity of the basic study design, uh, we want to consider participant follow-up. So here we're asking whether all participants who entered the study were accounted for at the uh, end of the study. Uh, so specific considerations are things like whether uh, exclusions after randomization or losses to follow up were accounted for, uh, whether there was an intention to treat analysis. So that means uh, when um, participants are analyzed, uh, uh, they're kept in the study groups to which they were randomized. Uh, and uh, lastly, uh, if the study was stopped early, why and what was the reason and what were the considerations there? In our study for today, um, the answer is yes. This was actually done extremely well um, by the authors. Exclusions were clearly discussed. Uh, the data set itself uh, was 99.9% .9 complete. Uh, so that means that pretty much all of um, the participants uh, that were randomized and entered the study, uh, we had an outcome measure for. Um, they didn't explicitly use the intention to treat analysis, um, uh, but I think that's probably likely because of the short duration um, of treatment. Uh, the study really was only, there was only a 28 day follow up and the in treatment interval was up to 10 days. Uh, and the patients were largely in hospital. So that kind of accounts for, um, accounts for all of that um, and probably makes, is the reason that um, uh, this section was so successfully done by, um, by the team. So we've just completed section A of the RCT checklist. Uh, is the basic study design valid for an RCT? And we've answered yes to all three questions so we can move forward. Uh, now we'll go on to section B and look at whether the study was methodologically sound. This section, section B, has three questions to help us determine, help us to determine whether the study was methodologically sound or not. So the first one is around blinding. So this is um, where whether um, either the participants the researchers uh, or anybody who's treating, assessing, or analyzing the outcomes, whether they knew, um, whether they knew uh, which intervention or which group uh, the participant or the patient or was in. Um, so you're blind uh, if you don't know. Um, so there's three points, three parts of this. This was an open label trial, which meant that the investigators and the participants definitely were knew which intervention um, was being given to the participants. Uh, it's not entirely clear whether the people assessing or analyzing the outcomes uh, were uh, blinded or not, but likely they were not. Um, it just wasn't explicitly stated uh, in, in the paper. Just because the uh, participants, investigators, and the uh, assessors uh, weren't uh, blinded doesn't mean, doesn't degrade necessarily the validity um, of the methodology. Uh, the researchers did make, make it very clear that this was, um, uh, this was done. And the reason uh, was uh, because of the rapid nature of the study and the importance um, of, um, uh, of getting the research done um, quickly. Uh, so it doesn't mean that we need to stop. So we can move on to the next question around um, uh, whether the study was methodologically sound or not. And this is around um, the study groups at baseline. So often we'll call this a table one. So here we're asking the question, were the study groups similar at the start of the randomized control trial? So what were the baseline characteristics of each study group and were, that, were they clear? And were there any differences between the study groups um, that could affect the outcomes? For our study, the answer to this question is yes, with a few qualifiers. Um, the intervention was allocated in a two to one ratio where uh, um, for every, every um, individual who received the intervention, two received usual care. Um, 
So that's, that's just an important consideration for the analysis, and the authors did take that into consideration. The other um, issue around differences between the study groups that could affect outcomes, there was one, um, one issue around the mean age, uh, which was a little bit higher in the intervention group. Um, so in the primary analysis, the authors didn't, didn't include it, but then they, I guess they noticed it and uh, they actually uh, did a, redid their analysis, uh, adjusting for age. So they did take this uh, into consideration in the end. The final questions in section B uh, is around um, uh, the study group intervention. So the question is, apart from the experimental intervention, did each study group receive the same level of care? Uh, meaning, are we sure that they were treated equally? So here are, here are the considerations are around having a clearly defined study protocol, um, uh, making sure that if there were any additional interventions that were given, uh, that they were similar between the study groups uh, and that the follow-up intervals uh, were the same for each of the intervention and the control group in the study. The answer to this question for our study was generally yes. Um, so going through the, each of the points, uh, there was a clearly defined study protocol. It's available as a part of the paper in a supplementary appendix. Uh, whether there were, if there were any additional interventions given, uh, respiratory support uh, was variable, meaning was it, you know, were, did people need extra oxygen or ventil ventilation support? That was variable. Uh, it was clearly documented uh, both in, um, in the tables uh, as well as in um, the analysis of outcomes. And the last question is around um, follow-up interv intervals. Um, the follow-up interval was, was equal and standard at 28 days. The intervention duration was variable according to sort of the clinical picture. So the interve intervention duration of receiving dexamethasone in the study was between three and 10 days, it looks like. It's not 100% clear, uh, but um, the primary outcome was um, assessed uh, at 28 days for all the participants, whether they were in the intervention uh, or the control group. So we're at the conclusion of section B and we've generally answered yes. The study was methodologically sound. So we're gonna move on to section C and section D uh, where in section C we'll consider what the results were and then in section D later on, we'll think about the impact, uh, the local impact uh, of, uh, of the study and their results. Moving on to section C, where we're looking at the results, there's three questions in this section. So the first of these three, number seven, uh, is around outcomes. And we want to know whether the effects of the intervention were reported comprehensively. So we're looking at, um, uh, from a statistical point of view, we're looking at whether there was a power calculation, uh, which statistical tests were used, were p-values reported, um, so all of those um, uh, statistical um, um, considerations around in creating inferences um, are important. Uh, we're also looking to make sure that the results were um, expressed appropriately um, and reported, um, uh, reported accurately, uh, meaning we're looking to make sure that there's no missing or incomplete data, uh, that there isn't a differential dropout between the study or the intervention group. Um, and that the researchers have thought about potential sources of bias. So this is a big section um, and uh, we'll go through it um, one by one in the, next, um, in the next slide. So the answer to this question for our study is a little bit complicated. It's yes and no. I think it's mostly yes, um, but there are, there are a, few, uh, a, a few concerns or a few um, limitations. Uh, so let's go through these points one by one in order um, that they're listed here on the slide. Uh, so um, uh, they did, the authors did do an a priori power estimate. They estimated they wanted um, their power to be 90% and developed um, their study protocol based on that. The results overall were reported well. Um, the primary outcome was survival, which is a, which is a, binary, um, uh, a binary outcome. Uh, they did do very, very clear 
um, statements of their statistical analysis. They did report relative and absolute effects. Um, there was a potential confounder around respiratory status and respiratory support uh, that they um, um, deduced, um, and we can look at, we can see that um, in the table one. Uh, so they did take that into account in the analysis. Um, and because, probably because uh, there was a short follow-up of only 28 days in a hospitalized patient, there really was no significant missing or incomplete data. And finally, uh, the p-values were well reported. The one reason that somebody might answer no to this uh, question um, is that bias and confounding could be better addressed. Uh, really, they only collected essential data um, as this was a planned rapid assessment in the early days of the pandemic. And uh, it's an important, um, it is an important research question in terms of using de dexamethasone um, uh, for respiratory distress uh, in a COVID um, patient. Uh, so they did justify um, uh, sort of the limited data collection, um, but we're probably missing some nuances here because they weren't able to collect um, as much uh, information um, or report uh, as much information on some, some of the potential uh, biases and confounders. The next question in considering the results is around precision. So whether the authors reported p-values or confidence intervals, one or the other, uh, as a part of the study uh, results. Uh, this overlaps a little bit with the previous question, but it's an, an, an important enough consideration that we want to uh, really uh, really think about it and consider it and look, um, look for this kind, of, um, uh, this kind of reporting. So the answer to this question uh, is quite clear. It's yes. Uh, the authors used confidence intervals um, and um, we'll look a little bit more closely in the next slide at, um, at the results, but there were very, very strong results in favor um, of the intervention um, of using dexamethasone um, uh, having benefit. Speaking of benefit, that's actually the, um, um, the last question of um, uh, exploring the results in section C. Um, and here we're looking at whether the benefits of the intervention outweigh the harms and the costs. So we want to uh, look at uh, what the size of uh, the treatment effect or the intervention effect was. Um, we want to look at um, if there were any harms or unidentified effects reported for any of the study groups, the intervention or the control, um, and whether a cost effectiveness analysis was, was undertaken or not. So the answer to this question for our study is yes. Uh, there was a very overwhelmingly positive large treatment effect for the primary outcome, uh, which if you remember is mortality at 28 days, uh, meaning mortality um, of a COVID patient um, at the 28 day mark from the time of hospitalization was significantly lower in the intervention group compared to the usual care group. The rate ratio was 0.83 and the confidence interval was 0.75 to 0.93. So this is very, very strong and very, very clear in favor of the benefit of this intervention. Um, the researchers didn't comment too, too much on the harms. Um, there are some uh, um, clinical and medical uh, risks to dexamethasone uh, treatment or using dexamethasone. Uh, however, with, with, with such a strong um, relationship to mortality uh, in a COVID patient and the short duration of treatment with the dexamethasone, uh, probably, um, probably the, the harm versus benefit ratio is very much in benefit of using um, dexamethasone in, in, in this patient population. Um, and a cost effectiveness analysis wasn't undertaken. The authors do, um, do reiterate that this was a rapid, um, rapid response to the pandemic. It was rapidly conducted research that they uh, really only, um, I guess in the spirit of, um, of doing things well and rigorously, but also quickly, they had to limit the kinds of data and the amount of data that they collected. Um, so they didn't really proactively address this. Um, I'm sure um, though that dexamethasone in most contexts isn't a particularly expensive medication 
um, and um, the cost versus the benefit would also be in favor of the intervention. We're moving into the home, set, home stretch here. Um, so uh, the last section um, of the RCT checklist is around thinking about the impact of the results and whether the results will help locally and, uh, and in other sort of broader contexts. In this framework, in section D, there's two questions when, we, when we're thinking about whether the results will be helpful or not. Uh, the first one is around local context. So we want to know whether uh, the results can be applied to your um, local population or in your context. Um, and um, th this is a bit of an individual question for any for every individual appraiser um, um, from a critical point of view. So you're thinking about how you're going to use this, perhaps um, the results of this in, in your work or in your context. So are the study participants similar to the people in your own usual care setting? Uh, would there be any differences between your population and the study participants? Uh, and would that change the outcomes? Uh, are these outcomes relevant or important to your context? Um, are there any outcomes here that you would have liked to have reported but haven't been, or that have been that you would have liked to see studied but haven't been studied? Uh, and then there are, are there any limitations of the study that would affect your decision um, as to uh, whether this would um, change your practice or not? This is a bit of an individual um, kind of reflection, um, like I said, by, by the person who's actually um, uh, appraising, uh, appraising this um, article. So I, I, we put here, can't tell, but likely yes. Um, uh, this study was done among hospitalized patients in the United Kingdom, uh, which is a high income country. So if you're from a different context, hard, hard to know um, whether, um, whether this would, could be applicable or not, but I think likely yes. There may be enough similarities amongst hospitalized patients with COVID around the world to make this very, an important study for other locations. Um, the other issue here was there was limited additional data collected on patient characteristics. Um, again, the researchers justified this um, by uh, stating that um, their goal really was uh, to come up with high quality evidence for a very focused research question and to do it quickly so that it could impact care um, uh, for COVID. Uh, while we were still um, in, um, still in the middle of the pandemic. And the other consideration around the impact of the researchers, uh, the impact of this research um, is um, value over current care. So does the intervention provide greater value to the people um, in your care than any of the existing interventions? Um, and then we, we think we think about sort of other issues around what resources are needed to introduce this intervention, taking in, taking into account time, finances, skills, uh, or training required to implement the intervention, and whether local um, lo local jurisdictions have the resources uh, to move um, uh, move to adopt this intervention. Perhaps they would have to reinvest or um, move resources from one area to another, and is that justifiable or not? So I think the answer to this really is yes, across all contexts. Um, uh, dexamethasone is generally inexpensive and available in many settings around the world. It's generally a well-known medication to be administered amongst hospital healthcare workers who would be able to administer it with very little additional training required. And in fact, this was a landmark study that was published in February 2021. Um, the preprint was made available much earlier, and this study really did contribute to a change in the approach to management of COVID-19 uh, in uh, hospital patients uh, around the world and continues, um, continues to be one of the mainstays um, of, um, of good treatment uh, for COVID even, um, even now.